Well, good afternoon. As colleagues continue to join us, we'll begin. I'm John Lane, and it's my pleasure to serve as the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Equity Initiatives at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, or SHEO. SHEO is a proud founding partner of the Civic Learning and Democracy Engagement Coalition, and I'm equally as delighted to serve as moderator of this session on state strategies to ensure equity is integral to civic engagement in higher education. Thus, our session title, which serves also to frame our engagement this afternoon, State Systems. Most higher education institutions already offer civic learning, but only for some students. How can state systems help bring equity to the civic learning movement? And what should they not do? Uh, the session title, its timing following our excellent plenary session just concluded, and the panelists are meant to extend the conversation in very practical ways and provide additional insights. As we start, a few reminders. So that all of us are best acquainted with each other, I'll invite you to enter your names and affiliations in the chat room. Our session will begin with our panelists describing state and multi-state strategies, and then we'll follow up with audience Q&A. Um, however, we are eager for your questions, comments, and resources throughout the session. So please enter them into the chat room at any time. Uh, feel welcome as well to use uh, the raised hand feature. Uh, our session administrator is also providing our code of conduct in our chat room to affirm the value of everyone's perspectives as we all contribute to this important talk. And last is a reminder that we are recording. And, uh, we are really looking forward to engaging with you. So thank you again for sharing this time with us. With that, I'll begin with Dr. Richard Freeland. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Yes, Dr. Freeland is the former commissioner of higher education for Massachusetts and the former president of Northeastern University. He brings valued insight into the roles higher education systems can play within the states and collaboratively between states to promote civic education. Commissioner Freeland, thank you again for being here. I know you are a part of an effort to promote civic education just cited in the plenary session, bringing that civic education promotion among leaders of state higher education systems. Do you see a role for systems in linking the effort to promote civic education to the goals of equity and inclusion? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, the, the aspiration of the CLDE coalition is to make civic education a universal part of the college experience in this country. For this to happen, civic education needs to be a priority for individual colleges and universities, including, of course, public colleges. One way to advance that goal is to make civic education a priority for public systems of higher education, statewide systems, university systems, and college systems, four-year and two-year, since these systems are in a position to influence the work of individual campuses within their states. Against that background, the CLDE Coalition has formed a partnership with CEO, which is the Organization of State Higher Education Executive Officers, and NASH, which is the National Association of System Heads, with the goal of persuading the system leaders with whom they work to prioritize civic education. I am helping to lead this effort along with my colleague, Nancy Shapiro from the University System of Maryland, who you will hear from later in this session. The vehicle we are creating to achieve our purpose is called the Multi-State Collaborative for Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement a coming together of state system leaders in support of CLDE goals. So far, the collaborative includes the major systems of four states, Maryland, Massachusetts, Utah, and Virginia, and we hope to expand to 10 or 12 states within the next few months. That core group of state systems will then undertake to support each other in developing robust programs and policies in the area of civic education and in persuading additional states to join the effort. So that is how and why the CLD coalition hopes 
to build momentum for the movement among state systems of higher education. I will now turn back to John Lane to introduce John Reif, uh, who will in turn introduce, who is a uh, the representative on the multi-state collaborative from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, Dr. John Reif is the Director of Civic Learning and Engagement at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. He's led the department's work to support civic learning and engagement at the campus level. Uh, so Dr. Reif, I'll ask you to share more about the work there with multiple campuses connecting civic and community engagement with the state's prioritization of racial equity in higher education. always helps to unmute. Thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, Richard, for uh, setting the context for my presentation. Uh, I'd like to make three points about uh, how uh, civic learning and civic engagement and racial equity can be brought together by the work of a state system with its campuses. Uh, and I'll, so one starting point is to use the statewide system as a platform to name this work as critically important. So a second element is to organize distributed leadership across the campuses. And then a third element is to offer catalytic funding to the campuses to help them move forward. So I wanna take each of those points and talk about them first with civic learning and engagement, and then with racial equity connected to and braided around civic learning. So civic learning and engagement. The Massachusetts Board of Higher Education uh, named civic learning as a strategic priority for public higher education 10 years ago in 2012. And with the naming of that as a strategic priority, it was then written into uh, opportunities for campuses to get funding from the Department of Higher Education, which is the state agency that uh, works under the guidance of the board. So the Funding came in small amounts. Uh, there was a program called the Higher Education Innovation Fund, or HEIF, or HIF. And uh, HIF opportunities were in the neighborhood of $75,000 maximum for an individual campus, or $150,000 for a consortium of campuses. So it's not really big money, but it's enough money to do something and campuses were invited to uh, submit proposals addressing any of the major strategic priorities of the Board of Higher Ed. Civic learning then was among those. And I'll come back to the high funding uh, opportunities when I get into the racial equity piece. So 2012, it was named as a strategic priority. 2014, the board passed a policy defining civic learning in a pretty broad way. Uh, the board said civic learning uh, involves acquiring the knowledge and the skills, both intellectual and practical, that people need to be, to have uh, informed and effective involvement in civic and democratic life. And it also involves acquiring an understanding of the social and political values that underlie democratic structures and practices. So you got knowledge, skills, and values into the definition. The policy called on the campuses to involve all their undergraduates in civic learning as they had defined it. And to do that through courses, through the co-curriculum, and through engagement with communities beyond the campus. And then it called on the Department of Higher Ed to uh, convene the campuses to provide funding to the extent that that was available uh, and to track the 
extent and variety of civic learning across the campuses. So there was a policy. Then the next step was to charge someone to work with the campuses. That turned out to be me. I was offered a part-time position as Director of Civic Learning and Engagement, which started in 2015, and um, followed up by calling on the campuses to identify courses that had a substantial piece of civic learning uh, in them as defined by the board policy. Then I started doing public convenings to build networks for mutual support and to do campus professional development. Um, so that's the civic learning piece. Now, racial equity. In 2018, the Board of Higher Ed said, racial equity is our top strategic priority for our public campuses. A number of initiatives flowed out of that decision. One of them, I'll talk about two very briefly that I've been part of directly. One of them starting in 2020 was a total revisioning of undergraduate education. Uh, uh, the About 70 people were convened from across the state to take part in writing a new vision for the undergraduate experience, which is called the new undergraduate experience, which had racial equity and racial justice threaded through every part of it. It was calling on our campuses to rethink and reinvent themselves around racial equity. There were those high grants continued to be made available to the campuses. A consortium of our campuses, including Cynthia Lynch, who's on the screen here today, uh, made a proposal for uh, a consortium grant to focus on anti-racist community engaged teaching. And uh, I was then asked to be program director, uh, project director on that project. And we did a bunch of work to figure out 21 or so principles for anti-racist community engaged teaching. And then we uh, condensed those down to four major principles. And we did faculty development with the, the campuses, the four campuses that had been part of this consortium. And then we organized a virtual symposium that we had 549 people come to from all over the country, uh, 325 of them from our own campuses in Massachusetts to talk about anti-racist, community-engaged teaching. Uh, and that was a piece then that the grant started. We formed a, con a consortium that continues the New England Equity and Engagement Consortium. And that consortium then was very interested in connecting with the next piece of statewide articulation, a 10-year strategic plan system-wide for racial equity. And as that plan was generated and adopted by our Board of Higher Ed in last June. Um, it called on the campuses in very specific ways mm -hmm. to carry out the vision that had been articulated in the new undergraduate experience. So what are the actual changes that the campuses are being asked to make? What are the actual changes that the Department of Higher Ed is being asked to make? And how might the campuses and the department work together one thread in that very large fabric is civic learning and civic engagement. And one of the places you can find it is on page 36 and page 37 of the plan, where um, the plan calls on us together to figure out what would civic learning outcomes be if we looked at them through a lens of racial equity. Um, we have heard in this forum about a variety of formulations of civic learning outcomes, including uh, the very powerful one that AACNU put into the 2012 
um, crucible moment document. Mm -hmm. you look at page four, you'll find it there. Um, and that was a guiding vision for us in Massachusetts in 2014 when we came to the um, uh, policy on civic learning. And that was generated for us mostly by a bunch of white folks sitting around talking to each other, thinking about our mostly white students and what do they need to learn? What knowledge, what skills do they need? So what we're doing now, and we're right in the midst of a project that is multi-campus that has uh, faculty, staff, and students of color and white folks working together to revision, to rethink what civic learning outcomes should be for our students, thinking both about our white students and our students of color. And then what is the professional development we will need to do to help our faculty and our staff work with those students to bring them to those learning outcomes. And this is uh, again, supported by another HIF grant. Um, civic learning outcomes through a lens of racial equity and racial justice. And again, one of the places we'll take this beyond faculty development on our own campuses okay. is to a symposium, which we will be offering on uh, March 31st. And it's in collaboration with Campus Compact. It's already, the registration page is already open on the Campus Compact website. And when I stop talking, I'll figure out how to put it in the chat so you can access it. I think this is a good place for me to stop and I'll turn it back to you, John. John, I wanna thank you uh, for the description. Uh, and I know that you generated questions for all of us as you have for me. There's so much work uh, behind the scenes, the engagement with the legislature, the office of the governor, onboarding, other stakeholders to provide the policy support, uh, to provide uh, the uh, financial support, the high funds. So I, I really look forward uh, to us circling back around in a few minutes and, and engaging you with this. It's fantastic. Thank you again. You're welcome. Next, I would like to invite our panelist, Dr. Nancy Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Education and Outreach and Special Assistant to the Chancellor for P20 Education at the University System of Maryland. She has been a leader in civic education policy development with the system-wide Board of Regents for a number of years. Additionally, Dr. Shapiro has been a steering committee member and thought leader at the National Association of State Systems, or NASH, and with Commissioner Freeland is helping to lead our coalition's multi-state collaborative. Dr. Shapiro, after hearing uh, what uh, John Reif has shared with us and the work going on in state and, and that engagement uh, statewide with campuses and what's happening at campus levels, I'd like to ask you if you can give us an example of how you raise the issue of civic education and civic engagement above the campus level to the level of the Board of Regents. Um, top down, bottom up, or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and I'm delighted to be here um, with, with all my colleagues. I apologize for being late. I was running another meeting right before this. But um, but before I talk a little bit about Maryland, I, I also wanted to mention something about NASH, the National Association of System Heads, for those of you who don't know what NASH is. I think everybody knows what a SHEO is, State Higher Education Executive Officer. But NASH is actually an association of system heads. Mm -hmm. There are, that involves right now, 65 systems across the country. Um, a system is defined as more than one institution, individual institution, a group of institutions that each have autonomy, but have report through either a chief executive officer and or a board of regents or board of governors. So those are the 65 systems that are part of NASH. Public higher education, education systems, just so you know, um, educate approximately 75% of the nation's students in four-year public higher education. So 
systems, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that I'm working with, with Richard, um, sort of a collaboration, with both a systems and um, the Shios, to try to create scale for all the things that John just described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, as a sort of a little bit of a briefing, um, I want to suggest that we all know, I'm not, you know, I, I have no doubt that every one of us knows that individual institutions have really robust um, activities going on with respect to civic education and civic engagement. Um, our individual institutions have students, uh, student affairs work, academic affairs work, service learning, wonderful work around um, voter engagement. There's a ton of stuff going on at our individual institutions. And the question is, you know, if we can mobilize the system, we can have, we can sort of have an exponential impact on civic, you know, civic learning <clears throat> across the country. So that's sort of the goal. Um, in Maryland, we have a lot of important work going on. We have 12 institutions, 12 public institutions that are part of our system. And it is a very diverse system. One of the most diverse in the country. We have R1 institutions. We have comprehensive institutions that prepare the most teachers for the state. We have three historically black institutions. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at the state of Maryland. It's a very peculiar shape, shaped state and probably the most peculiar shape in the whole country. We have Western Maryland, very rural out by West Virginia. And we have the Eastern shore on the other side of the Chesapeake Bay that's sort of isolated from the, the main part of the state. So we have a real diverse geography, diverse. So the question is, you know, what, you know, how does a system like Maryland um, mm -hmm. create a coherent plan around uh, civic learning and democratic engagement? Well, I'll tell you just briefly the, the story of what I did in Maryland. Um, in 2017, we sort of, I, I talking around the, the, the office actually, we decided that we really had a huge responsibility in making sure that our students graduated um, with enough grounding in uh, democratic systems and democratic um, um, engagement that they felt empowered to do that. So how are we gonna do this? So we decided to create a statewide convening, you know, to John's point, convenings matter, at least pre-COVID they did. And I think they will continue to matter like this one. Um, and our statewide convening, we decided to invite the system led conversation with the community colleges, the K-12 schools, the independent, the private universities, because civic learning and democratic in engagement goes across. I mean, we're educating the generation of the future. So we have a huge investment in this. Because we had such a broad audience, we invited some pretty spectacular keynote speakers. We invited our governor, Governor Larry Hogan, very prominent Republican governor. And we invited one of our prominent senators, Barbara Mikulski, Democratic Senator, who has a small lady, but a big impact. Um, and they were the two keynote speakers for our event, which really lifted the event to a statewide level. At that event, it was a day long workshop and we divided into working groups and we came up with the report. And after that, I put myself on the Board of Regents agenda and I gave a report about this convening. And the Board of Regents asked me to convene a task force, a Regents task force to make recommendations around moving the civic learning agenda forward. When you get a request from a board of regents to put forward a task force, that gives you a lot of authority at the system level. And so we invited faculty and representatives from various um, parts of our institutions to come together and sort out some recommendations um, that, that they could all agree on. And again, John gave you some really good examples of the kinds of things, the kinds of uh, work that such a task force can do. The three things that I would say um, were sort of foundational for the work that we're doing in Maryland. Um, the first is we came up with a written report with recommendations that was endorsed by the Board of Regents. Within that set of recommendations, we suggested, we, we recommended that there be a student leadership committee, representatives from across the system 
to create a regular student leadership committee um, that would meet regularly. We, we set it up to meet four times a year um, with co-chairs from two different institutions, two student co-chairs. Um, what was interesting about the student leadership committee is that as elections approached, as you know, in, in at the two, at the presidential election and the, the off-year election, they decided they wanted to meet more often because what they wanted to do was share what they were doing across their institutions. Um, when you think about it, what we have, you know, the opportunity we have to sort of spread the word, um, it's not just about elections and voting, although that's a big piece. If we can get every student registered to vote and every student voting, your vote is your voice. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent. If you don't vote, you don't have a voice in the way that your, your community is gonna be governed and the way your country is gonna be governed. So that's like participatory democracy was a big thing for our students. And they really got, went, went to town getting out the vote. But the other thing we did was create a, um, a set, every campus has a voting coordinator by law in Maryland. I don't know, if you, you may not have that in your states, but we have voting coordinators on our campus. And the system convenes the voting coordinators as another group. The voting coordinators and the student leaders sometimes meet together, depending on what the topics are that they're talking about. And so what, you, what we generate is um, a lot of momentum and sharing of best practice. Nobody has to start at the ground level. Um, they actually can build on what the best practices of each other's work. Um, and the last thing I would say is that I signed every one of our institutions up for the National Study of Learning, Voting and Engagement. Some of you heard that uh, Nancy Thomas's presentation yesterday, the NCELB report. Um, we have all 12 of our institutions um, are, have agreed to sign up for that. And as a consequence, I get a, in addition to campus re um, reports, I get a system report on how well our system did with respect to voter registration. And it's broken down by um, by demographics, by you know race, ethnicity, it's also broken down by major. So if you don't get that report, you find out that the computer science majors aren't voting, and the edu and the librarians are. Go to the computer science majors and you say, "Don't you care about you know the future?" You know, it's a there's a, there's leverage that we have because of the information that we get. So I would say that um, moving things from the system to the, from the campus level to the system level is a very valuable thing to do because you get a lot of bang for the buck. And I'll stop there. Fantastic work, Nancy, to you and, and the University of Maryland system. And uh, I'm sure all of us will be interested in some resources. Uh, if, if you can find those um, so that we can share them, that would be great, it, very insightful. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Uh, to you and to John, you've shared uh, two perspectives on statewide work with engagement uh, with the campuses. Uh, John at the department and with that governance model, and then Nancy, as you uh, clarified and verified the, uh, the system-wide engagement and, and how to leverage that model to support the work. Uh, with that, we're going to invite perspective now from our colleague, Dr. Jody Fissler. Uh, Dr. Fissler is the Senior Associate for Assessment Policy and Analysis at the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. She brings insight into working in a statewide context that can be described as a loosely organized system. So for this perspective, Dr. Fissler, when it comes to advancing campus level engagement, of civic education, would you describe the challenge and importance of promoting a statewide vision while also respecting the autonomy and the unique circumstances of each institution? Yes, thank you, Dr. Lane, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, it's been very interesting for me to hear what's going on uh, in those other states. Um, before I get into the question that uh, I've just been asked, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about Virginia, just so that you understand the context that we're operating in. Um, as, as we said, you know, we are a very loosely organized system. We're a system with a small S, not a capital S. Um, we have 
39 inst public institutions in Virginia. 15 of those are independently governed four-year institutions. And those include R1 institutions down to, uh, not down to, but include R1s, uh, small liberal arts colleges, um, HBCUs, a military academy, very diverse in those 15 institutions. We also have one public two-year transfer institution that is not a community college. And we have 23 community colleges, which are actually organized into a system. So we have a system, a capital S system within our small S system. And when it comes to our community colleges, there are ways in which they operate as a system. And then there are ways in which we regard them as individual institutions. So depending on the issue, sometimes we may be talking about 39 entities and sometimes we're talking about 17 entities. It's, it's rather confusing. Um, so with that, that means that you know, we, we have these institutions, uh, the expectation of a lot of autonomy. And there are, there, we are very much limited to what we are, I mean, I guess as with everybody, we, as, in terms of what we are legally mandated to do. You know, our authority comes from the Code of Virginia. And if we are not granted a, uh, a power by the Code of Virginia, then that's really not an area that, that we can say anything about. So unlike Massachusetts, uh, you know, we, we don't have any authority over curriculum. We can't touch anything. Curriculum belongs in the hands of the faculty, belongs in the hands of the institutions. However, we do have a legal duty to oversee a, a policy on the assessment of student achievement, um, which is kind of interesting. We have a requirement that, uh, about related to assessment, but not related to, to curriculum. So that's how why I'm the one talking to you now about uh, civic engagement. It might seem odd that the assessment person is the one talking to you about civic engagement, but that's, that's why. So all of our civic engagement work is basically coming through our assessment policy. In 2017, uh, I was tasked with uh, overseeing a revitalization of the assessment policy. I started at CHEV in 2016. So this was my, my first um, big deliverable, if you will. And uh, you know, we wanted the policy had kind of not been looked at for a while. So we wanted to refresh it. And the way we operate at CHEV uh, is that we, we work collaboratively with the institutions on any policy that affects them. Uh, so we have extensive input, very large task force was you know, part of developing this policy. And then once the policy is developed, then the institutions understand that they are expected to abide by it. So we had this task force uh, to look at the assessment policy. And at that time, the state strategic plan for higher education included two specific references to civic engagement and talking about uh, helping students or working with the institutions to uh, help students build the capacity to succeed in the workplace and in civic engagement. So because of that reference to civic engagement in the state strategic plan, um, the, the assessment policy task force took that as uh, not a directive, but certainly an expression of sincere interest on the part of our state council that civic engagement was a priority. And so we, we included civic engagement as one of the core competencies that all institutions, all public institutions are required to assess. Um, other ones are being critical thinking, written communication, quantitative reasoning, and then two that the institutions can select based on their own academic uh, missions and priorities. So that's how I'm coming into this. And my philosophy as an assessment professional is not that it's not to view assessment as simply about compliance, um, but that there's it should be meaningful. And it's a part of the teaching and learning process. It does not just stand alone. It's not a box checking, checking exercise. And since this was a new expectation, civic engagement had never been part of the assessment policy before. There was a lot of uncertainty among the, the folks at the institutions about what does this mean? You know, what are you expecting us to do? Um, and so my, my aim was to try to help be a, a facilitator of, for institutions to develop their um, approach to civic engagement. Um, assessment, yes, but obviously if we're assessing something, presumably we want to actually you know, have some educational experiences that, that go under that. Um, so I, you know, I exercise what I consider to be the superpower of the state agency, which is convening. We can convene like nobody's business. 
Um, and it's, it's really about developing, I think Rob Anderson said in the earlier session, developing the coalition of the willing. Um, so in our policy, we don't actually define civic engagement. We don't name learning outcomes. That's up to each individual institution to define it for themselves and to articulate learning outcomes for themselves. But there's a lot that they can learn by talking to each other. Uh, and that's where I feel like my role comes in. I can create opportunities and structures where institutions can share what they are doing. They can work through issues um, and uh, make progress, I guess, in that way. Um, you know, I think it's important to, um, to be mindful of what we're asking institutions to do, especially when there is no money attached to this. Unlike, again, unlike in Massachusetts, you know, we issue our assessment policy and there's no money that comes with that to address any of the expectations in that policy. It's just part of the, the cost of doing business, if you will. So when we throw in something that's new, like civic engagement, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, uh, especially for some institutions that are experiencing it for the first time. And we had very spirited conversations among the task force uh, that developed the policy about what civic engagement meant. You know, there were some institutions, especially the community colleges, that were really concerned that we were mandating volunteer hours, or that was that was the expectation that we would be mandating volunteer hours. And they said, you know, our students are, you know, working parents, they, you know, they've got multiple jobs, they can't be expected to, to do that. And then we had on the other side, uh, some of the institutions that said, you can't make us put something in our core curriculum, you know, we're not going to add a history course or a government course. Um, but we have really robust uh, extracurricular uh, community service opportunities. And so, you know, our policy had to be flexible enough to accommodate all of the different ways the institutions felt civic engagement was relevant and appropriate for their particular student populations. Um, so I see it as my role to work with them uh, and to, to really try to strike a, a balance between uh, requiring something and there being some accountability for that and then also giving them the flexibility to enact that expectation in the way that is most appropriate and relevant to them. Do we strike the right balance? I don't know. I hope we do. Um, I imagine there's always some room for uh, adjustment. And I know that there are some institutions that would prefer that we actually be more directive. They would like us to just say, here's the test, here's or the survey, do this, and just report back on your results. And there are others that would absolutely bristle against that. Uh, and so I have to kind of manage all of those competing desires and interests um, on the part of, of the institutions. Um, but I would say that there, there can be a lot of um, goodwill that gets built up by, by doing the convening and trying to present myself as a partner uh, in this work. I'm not a civic engagement or community engagement specialist. Uh, I don't have all the answers to this. I'm, I'm learning about this as much as everybody else is. Um, but I think, you know, positioning the agency, Chev, as, you know, we, we want to be there to help advance this work. We hope that you will take it seriously and come along with us uh, and, and engage in this process in a, in a way that's meaningful for your institution. Um, you know, I think we have, I've certainly seen a lot of energy around this topic and I'm heartened, I'm heartened by that. Uh, so even though we, we don't have a lot of the same levers that perhaps other states do just by the nature of, of the organization that we have, Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we are in a position to help advance the work in a meaningful sense. So I'll stop there. A fantastic insight. Uh, I thank you. Thanks to John and to Nancy as well. Let's open the floor for questions. I, I'm sure you have uh, some inquiries you'd like to make or some thoughts and you'd like some feedback. Now check the chat, chat room as well. And as you're thinking about that, I would like to say something I thought of in listening to you, Jody. I may have, by focusing some on funding, I may have given the impression that there's a lot of money going into Massachusetts work. There's not. What, what I wanted to highlight was uh, some instances of very strategic use of small amounts of 
funding for catalytic change. And I think that uh, our campus partners have been very creative in accessing those funds from the Department of Higher Ed to do some of that catalytic change. Um, but it's not nearly enough. We all know we need more. Yeah, and Nancy, great point, John. Nancy wants to follow uh, up. So yes, I actually, I actually wanted to um, build on that thing, on that topic too. Funding is by far the most challenging thing for any, you know, any of us engaged in higher education. Um, it's, it, it's not easy to find. And I like the way John framed it as sort of strategic small amounts. I'll give you an example. Um, and the, you know, it's creativity, creativity. <laughs> it's like, um, so we actually had a, um, an endowed fund, um, not, not a huge amount of money, uh, basically to endow a lecture. Um, from, for a former chancellor. We, endowed, we paid for several lectures over a course of um, his of course of years. And then it turned, then COVID came and we couldn't actually have these lectures as public lectures with receptions. So we had some money accumulate in this endowed fund. And we decided uh, in conversation with his family, he passed away, but we, um, this is the Donald, Don Langenberg, very you know, well-known chancellor and um, higher education um, guru over for many years. So we spoke with the Langenberg family and suggested that we trans that we maybe move the lecture, the Langenberg lecture to become a Langenberg legacy um, that we would use to give small amounts of money to um, select students who are engaged in civic education projects on the campuses. What that did, at a, and they were very supportive of that, what that did is it allowed us um, to encourage the campuses to have a nomination process for a student award that we would give. This is two thousand dollars. We're not, you know, we're not talking about lots of money here. Um, small. We had we had several um, opportunities to give give Langenberg Legacy Fellows awards to students who applied for this award and then get them recognized by the Board of Regents again, using the Regents as a, um, you know, a, a place for, for uh, reward, you know, intangible reward. And as a consequence, the campuses found they would get all these applications for great projects. And we were only gonna give one fellowship, one little fellowship out, but the campuses found money to give, they didn't wanna only give it to one of their students. So they gave it to others. They found ways to support other student projects. I would say that um, you can use small amounts of money very creatively to generate um, activity. It's, you know. oh, great point. Uh, we have a question from Elaine. Good afternoon to you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, John, I, John, great to see you. Uh, I'm curious about, you mentioned one of the three things was distributive uh, leadership across campuses. And I'm just wondering if you or possibly Nancy could say a little bit more, how did you utilize the leadership of college presidents or did you in these uh, efforts? Okay, how about Nancy, how about if I take a quick run at it and then pass it to you? Um, so the level that I work at is not with the presidents. Right. Um, I came into my role at the State Department of Higher Education from being a uh, campus director of civic learning, uh, civic engagement and service learning at UMass Amherst. And uh, it's the folks in those kinds of roles who are the champions. I really um, resonated when Rob Anders said, Anderson said in the last session that uh, he's looking to build a strong coalition of the willing and it's those people at that level who are the champions for civic learning and civic engagement on their campuses, who I've had the opportunities to convene. Jody, you said that convening is your strong point, and it's also, I think, my strong point that I'm um, offering in a variety of different ways uh, opportunities for people to either meet with me or to meet with me and one another and uh, build shared understandings, exchange ideas, exchange resources, 
make plans for how we could do stuff together that we can't do by ourselves. Um, and then those folks go upstream to their provosts and to their presidents. And they can say, the Department of Higher Ed is calling on us to do this stuff. It's in the policy. Uh, it's in the strategic plan. And the people at the higher levels sometimes listen to them and say, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, would you please take some leadership for the campus on this? Uh, and so that's, that's how it works at, at my level. We have just gotten a new commissioner who took office November 1st. And one of the things he brought with him when he came in was a very explicit commitment to the public purposes of higher education, uh, to the um, role of higher ed in building and promoting democracy. And we're just starting to think together about how he might work with the presidents while I'm working with the people at the level that I connect with. Okay, over to you, Nancy. Sure, so I, um, I love John's uh, strategic political leverage there, you know, mm. if the, if the um, Shio's office of the, you know, says do it, somebody has to do it, then it, you know, it gets done. Um, mm -hmm. I, I work sort of the same way. Um, uh, the chancellor um, reviews every president, is, does a performance review for every president. Mm. Um, if the chancellor puts an item on the performance review, the, the presidents have to respond. So that's one way um, to do it. Um, and another way to do it is we, you know, there's, there's always one or two presidents in a system who are who have, are passionate about something, you know, whatever, you know, they have, they have a, a you know, a, a mark, they, they wanna make their mark. Um, we have a couple of the presidents in the system are, um, have, are very um, articulate and passionate about things. Um, one of them just retired, you may recognize the name, Freeman Hrabowski. Freeman Hrabowski is a sort of a nationally known, certainly in Maryland, a very, very um, important voice for equity, um, he was the president of UMBC, recently retired, and um, UMBC is known for, for graduating the most um, African-American medical students in the country, I mean, among other things. So if Freeman is a keynote speaker or takes it on as a, as a mantle of leadership, then he raises it and he talks about it and other presidents sort of think of it as important. And finally, I would say that um, one of the recommendations, and I did put the report in our, um, in the, a link to our report um, in the chat. One of the recommendations is that our institutions should aim for being recognized with the Carnegie classification of, of a, a engaged university. It's an optional accreditation. It's not something you know, that's mandated by the state higher ed authority or anything, but being recognized means that the whole campus has to work together to earn that, that accreditation. Um, if that's on the list of things that gives you a gold star, then the presidents get involved because accreditation is something that they you know, put on their, um, on their list of things that they accomplished. So I would say those, those three things, um, you know, using the, you know, the power of putting things on an evaluation, um, getting a, a speaker, you know, getting a champion and um, aiming for an accreditation. Great. A follow-up question for you, Jody. So we heard from John about uh, civic education and then its intersection uh, with the racial equity as a the strategic priority in Massachusetts. Uh, Nancy has provided two examples uh, that I recall about the work of civic learning um, in the context of, of a very proactive uh, state institution in the system that uh, graduates high numbers of African-American enrollees. Um, um, and then Nancy also referenced 
that uh, the, the voter registration reports you can you can disaggregate by any number of measures, but also by race. And so, Jody, in the context of Virginia, uh, which uh, has the the environment of you know a robust sense of institution level autonomy, even though it's a system, lowercase, when you convene around this important theme, do you find that the theme of equity or mitigating inequities, the theme of inclusion or otherwise, is lost, uh, well received, it's championed and become a North Star? What's the sense of place about it in the context of uh, Virginia? Mm, thank you for that. Um, so one of the three pillars in Virginia's current strategic plan for higher education is to make higher education more equitable. So that is definitely something that from the, the state system perspective, you know, equity is, is one of our priorities. We don't have the linkage with civic learning and engagement the way uh, Massachusetts does. Uh, at least not yet. Uh, and this is a bit of a challenge for us. I mean, in, in all of our assessment work, not just with civic engagement, but all of the other competencies too, we, we had more spirited conversation among our assessment task force about how to ensure that equity was being attended to in terms of, you know, where we were going to require that results be disaggregated and that institutions focus on this. And we got a lot of pushback on that, partly because some of the systems uh, that institutions had already set up um, to assess don't necessarily lend themselves to a meaningful disaggregation of data. Uh, if they're doing course embedded or, or not, uh, if they're doing assessments where they're taking samples from a variety of courses, you know, they may have very small sample sizes from any given student demographic group. And so you know, they were concerned about, were we going essentially to require them to completely upend the assessment processes that they'd had in place for so long um, in order to, to do this. So, um, you know, we, we put language in our policy to say that disaggregation of data was strongly encouraged along the various dimensions that we, we highlight in our strategic plan for Virginia, which is race, ethnicity, gender, uh, rural population, and over the age of 25. Um, but we're not requiring that. Now, I will say, you know, one of the other areas that I've been in, heavily involved with in the last couple of years is for the first time networking our faculty developers and our teaching and learning centers. And that actually came out of an equity motivation as well. It was very interesting to me to see that for all the talk that we were doing at SHEB about equity, our approaches to addressing that were really focused on things like financial aid um, and more, I guess, administrative kinds of things, but nothing to do with classroom experience. And I raised the question, you know, how do we ignore what happens to students in the classroom? Um, and could, could we have any role to play in helping to, you know, bolster faculty ability to teach a more diverse student population effectively? And so again, through the, through the assessment lens, that's been my entree to everything. It's like, you wanna get better assessment results, then you've gotta work on things like better assignments and better assignments means more transparent assignments, assignment design. And so, you know, we've organized um, assignment design workshops and then we've actually created recently a statewide network of faculty and educational developers um, and held a workshop that was attended by you know, hundreds of, of faculty in Virginia on how to create more transparent assignments. Now we can take that and focus it specifically on things like assignments that build civic engagement skills. Uh, and that is an aspiration that I have um, you know, for the future. We just haven't done that yet. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it's very important and um... Your approach to it, I think, is strategic, and I think it's really helpful for us as a full audience. So I thank you. Well, we're right at time. So I want to thank uh, Richard Freeland, Joseph, Jody Fisler. I want to thank Nancy Shapiro and John Reif again uh, for your great insights. Uh, I encourage all of you to uh, save the resources that have been uh, entered into the chat room and as well. Uh, to look forward to the final session at 445. Uh, 
back out in the uh, the common plenary session uh, with Carol Gary Snyder, who's just been uh, the driving force behind our our project on civic learning and democracy engagement. Thank you again for being a part and very best wishes. A great afternoon. Thank you all for showing up. Yep, and thanks John for leading. Thank you. Yeah.